archaeology of the art of the Viking. Um, now, I, I tried to keep this to British Viking archaeology. And fortunately, um, as you're doing the research on these, you just get so lost in looking at images and trying to sort of work out what to do, going into the legends of Ragnarok and all the rest of it, trying to put this into the art. I completely forgot what I was doing, and then I realised, oh, um, where's all the British stuff? So I, I decided to pepper it in here and there. Um, so we, we do visit the Osberg ship. We actually visit the um, Scar vessel, which is off um, uh, the island of Sunday, um, the island, Isle of Orkney. Um, so this is actually um, a wonderful um, whale bone plaque that was actually found there. Um, and we look a tiny little bit about um, the Coppergate helmet, uh, which is one of three or one of very few Roman helmets ever found. We will go into the complete diatribe about horns on the helmet, as usual. Um, uh, but the main thing is we've got to try and focus on art without mentioning Ragnarok um, a thousand times. So we'll mention it 999 times instead. Um, so the whole thing about the Viking world is that their art itself um, <coughs> is, is a message, is a story, is something to be interpreted. But then again, isn't that what art is about? Uh, you look at something, uh, you look at a Van Gogh piece of work, um, and you, you can imagine things, he's trying to tell you something, whether it's his um, state of mind at the time. And you're looking at Renoir, um, you're looking, for example, at um, J.W. Turner, and you're looking at Ueni, what is, what is he actually saying? It's a message, it's a story from the past, is something being added, is this your interpretation? So, very much, Viking art is a complete interpretation. Um, and it's, it's, it's a message that they're trying to tell you, but naturally looking at um, how, how the art intertwines and all the rest of it, taking you on a journey is not an easy thing to do. But um, the, the story of Ragnarok um, is very much in, in the imagination and the hearts of the Vikings, where you see that um, <coughs> the beasts of Ragnarok, um, or the whole epic of Ragnarok. If any of you have, heard, have read the story of Mahabharat, um, okay, in my Harry Krishna days, that was quite an important um, publication. Um, the story of Mahabharat is about um, somewhat the destruction of the world and the gods being killed and mortal people and immortals and all the rest of it. Very similar to the story of Ragnarok, and that's very much in their art. So we will come actually back to this. I know Kathy has actually seen, seen it. It's not this big, it's about that big. And it's, it was found associated with a boat burial. We'll call it ship burial, why not? I will go into the other, um, the other area where I, I push, again, the Sutton Who ship burial, uh, not being Anglo-Saxon, but being Viking, because if somebody Swedish is buried there, they can't really be called Anglo-Saxon, when in fact they are, and it gets very confusing. But we'll look at that sort of area as well. So, nice little introdu introduction there, and Alan's not really interested in this lecture at all, because there's nothing to do with the Romans. So if I take your money now, right, um, and then you can leave. Um, so one thing, what, what, what we're going to do at the end, we're going to do a, um, a scratch and sniff. Uh, not the type of scratch and sniff card that I saw somebody make once. They, did a, they sent me a scratch and sniff card with a dead fly and a dead <laughs> spider crushed into the thing. Um, it's not that type of sc scratch and sniff. I've known some strange women in my time. Mm. Um, th these, these are the Lewis chess uh, pieces. Um, we, will, we, we don't really need to zoom in on, on any of these because we're going to look at them in a lot of detail. Um, a golden toothpick, a wonderful collection of goldware that was found in Germany. Um, a wonderful <laughs> object here as well, number four, like a, like a, um, a pointer, some description. Um, we've got a hoard. We've got a coin. Um, now, the one thing I will say about the, bar, the art of the Vikings is that their <coughs> coins weren't very good. Everything <coughs> else was absolutely unbelievable. But then again, coins weren't very good at all in this period. Eight, nine, ten hundred, nobody really bothered. Even a Byzantine coin, coin, they may have looked good, but they were a bit shoddy. Um, other than that, everything from the Viking world is, is astronomically beautiful. Um, we even look at axes. Um, we tried to dismiss the word ceremonial last week, um, and this week we're looking at we, we, we chuck in an axe, for example. I'll zoom in on this one if I may. Um, and you, 
can't really see it, unfortunately. Um, but you can see all this basically beautiful scroll work. Now wait for it, on an axe that is a composite of iron, uh, uh, bronze and silver. Which is a bit of a weird amount. Well, the actual blade itself? Yeah. Nice. Don't ask. I, ca I, can't, I, I know you're talking about temperatures and all of that. <coughs> yeah. Obviously, the, the silver's inlay, but having an amount oh, between yeah. bronze and iron. Yeah. No, yeah. But I suppose that it's sort of part of the metal that's melted in inlay. Yeah, inlay, but yeah. There, there you go. It's a very, you know your temperatures. It's very difficult to get a amalgam of bronze and iron. It's a very strange thing. But anyway, they, were, they did have the skills to do this. Uh, another weird item that we'll come on to in a short. In, is, that a axe head, used, is that a functional axe head? Is that a functional axe head, as in used in battle? I keep away from the word battle. But the thing is, um, you may have had something like this um, that you were attached to. You may have had something like this that may have been used in battle, cutting down a tree, or or it was, or it was ceremonial things that we don't really understand. But there are lots of things about archaeology that we don't really understand. But. But just sort of um, quickly going through this, a very odd item that we're going to go on to, figure on a throne. Um, we've got a wonderful gold um, um, a choker of some description there. We've got a wonderful uh, brooch, a wonderful silver brooch again. We'll zoom in on these, don't worry. Um, other wonderful figures. And this down here that we'll look at in a bit of detail is actually um, a tray, a wooden tray that's beautifully sort of... Uh, beautiful um, carving on it as well. So, without any complaints, we're gonna move on, because we look at this in a great deal of detail. And obviously, a sword there. So, let's, um, let's carry on. Now, the one thing that we do know is that you'd be mistaken for thinking um, whatever you think about this, but this is, this is a reconstruction of the Sutton Hoo ship burial uh, in the context of a Sweden, a Swedish leader that's buried at Sutton Hoo with an Anglo-Saxon supposed landscape. So what we find there, we, fi we find in the sense of art, we, we find a beautiful shield, we find buckets, uh, we find a helmet, we find a sword. Some of these are deliberately broken, ceremonially broken. Um, all these wonderful other artefacts associated with the Sutton Hoo ship burial. Um, and like, like many um, inferred uh, references and actual within the archaeology, like the Osberg ship, they buried some of their vessels and they also um, put some of their vessels out to sea, burnt them, and obviously the carcass floats down to the bottom with everything burnt, and then you've got the array of the vessel. Uh, one thing that has to be said is that time and time again, like the example at Scar of the island of Sande. Uh, there's a woman associated with a burial. We also don't know if the individual at Sutton was a man or a woman because very little evidence. It was immediately thought to be a man. It's got to be a man because there's armour and all the rest of it associated with it, right? But then again, as we, as we seem to know and we seem to understand that the Viking world um, <coughs> is, is full of yin and yang. You might find something that you think is associated with a man and it's associated with a woman. Um, and something that might be a bobbin associated with a wo woman might be associated with a man. And these things get very, very normal within this um, very equal society that we live in today. No comments on that. You're, you're a good demonstration of an equal society, Steve. You're looking after your daughter. And your ex-wife isn't. So, so there you go. This, this is, you're, 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 you're a typical <coughs> Viking individual where roles are switched. Um, and this was the typical Viking world. Um, we, see, we see an amulet here, which is Thor's hammer. Um, Thor's hammer may have been utilised by a male or a female or a child and so on. Um, it basically um, to project power, um, to project protection. Lots of these are about protection, aren't they, my learned friend Pete? He's won about ten of these through our raffles. So can anyone lift it? Oh, no, this is a little Thor's, Thor's hammer. Yeah, but it's Thor's hammer. Only Thor can lift it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people wear this stuff today. Yeah, people wear this stuff today. Amulets and exactly. And gold, of course. Exactly. The, this is a protection amulet. Mm. This, is, this, is to, this is to give you um, guidance. This is, this is all about the, the sense of symbolism. Again, the word we got back to the original word, the sense of symbolism in the wonderful Viking world. <laughs> um, 
why haven't I done the Vikings up until this point? Well, it's probably appropriate to do the Vikings up until this point because um, in the next few weeks we'll be choosing a new range of material that we'll be looking at. Instead of the archaeology of the art of things, we'll be looking at the archaeology of something else. Um, Gillian, um, I have spotted, you know you told me to put the archaeology of the art of erotica video online, YouTube. No, 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 I going to do part two, and I missed... Online, yeah, but you yeah. weren't here. No, I know, I missed it. Yeah, so why haven't you watched it online? Oh, I don't know. Because there's been 150 people watching it, and I'm thinking, right, okay, there's got to be some repeat offenders. And one person had been watching it from Lanswick Major, and I thought it may have been you. No. Or is it somebody else in the room? Because I can see who's watching my videos. Is it two hours long, like our lesson? Was it's about an hour and a half long, yeah. Well, you see, I, in the middle of the day, I can't spare. <laughs> So what's that on YouTube? Is yes, on YouTube, yeah. Ba yeah. Basically, um, you know... Oh, my God. <laughs> you, get, you get images of phallicism. and so weirdos going. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I see you did watch the video. No, I just saw the video. No, hang on a minute. It was you. No, I just saw the picture. Oh, you must have invited Dennis over to watch it. That's okay. Um, did you think it was sausages as well? <laughs> 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 Yeah, oh, no. oh, no. <laughs> sometimes there's a hole and, and you're really digging it a lot deeper now, so I think you should leave it there. It's usually me digging it deep. So um, now, here we go. Now, you suddenly got excited there. I saw you go, mm, you really got excited. So what, what we do in, in the Viking world... <laughs> You're not saying something I'm not. <laughs> you were in <really> it. <laughs> Sometimes there's a saying associated with this that that Viking gives me the horn. Who says that? Okay, you're not quick on the draw, are you? Erotica oh, gives me the horn. Oh, oh forget it. Moving <laughs> <laughs> on. So, so in the across the Viking world, there's been about two and a half, maybe three Viking helmets made of iron ever found, and that's it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so people draw the conclusion that after all these years, Vikings having horns on their helmets can't be real. Because, you know, we, we've demonstrated by an example the other week with the Waterloo helmet. If you've got things projecting out of your head, somebody's going to go for you with the sword. Um, and the sword's going to be guided directly onto your cranium. Sword cuts through the uh, metal, uh, you're dead. Okay? Having things on your helmet is not a good thing. Um, however... Um, we, we had, did find, and uh, you were with me, uh, Keith, and you were with me, Alan, where we looked into a display cabinet, uh, and after all those years thinking whether centurions actually did have um, a, an array of horse hair to create a crest on their helmet, whether that was real or not, we actually found um, an example in a cabinet in the military museum. So I think people did have crests and stuff on their helmets. Whether they went into battle with them is probably unlikely. Well, however, well, however... Well, However, how, that is the point I'm trying to make. There's no reason to say that they didn't have horns on their helmets at one point in time. The other thing as well is what we've also got our experience is all those stories of people um, on their Viking vessels going out, to, uh, going out to sea with helmets, with iron helmets on the vessels. You know, imagine 30... 35, 40 men and women on a vessel, oaring out to sea, going somewhere with 40 iron helmets, which is an incredible amount of weight. I'm sure you would all agree. Um, and they're very impractical to wear an iron helmet in, in battle. Um, so in lots of illustrations, what we do see actually, is, we... People, hang on, is people actually wearing um, leather equivalents, leather caps. Um, and this is what we're seeing on an illustration. Leather caps, and people are thought, no, they're iron helmets, they've obviously gone rusty. Steve? I was going to say, salt water is highly corrosive, and iron rusts like hell. All, you, all you've got to do is go like that on an iron helmet, and you've got a rust fingerprint. Well, you've place. answered it, Steve, you've answered it full stop. So, so in other words, what we've got, we, we can also, because so few of these have been found, now the Vikings went everywhere. They went everywhere, they, they went, um, to the far most reaches of Russia, they went all the way to Spain, they went, went to Italy, uh, they, they, they were the Varaginian guard, were actually the protected guard of the Byzantine Emperor Basil, uh, a thousand of them, 
Um, all the way to Iceland, Newfoundland, that we've only ever found two and a half, three of these hammers. <coughs> the reason why I'm saying two and a half is because the third one wasn't in a good state of, of preservation. So we've got this example, we've got the copper gate helmet, and we've got another example as well, and that's it. So that means that helmets weren't really utilised to sort of jump to the conclusion that they didn't have horns, and jump to the conclusion that they were all iron. Um, you can make of it as you will. But one thing about one thing about these helmets, they're basically very utilitarian, maybe parade helmets and iron helmets for parade, it's very, very difficult to see. I don't know if any of you have ever um, um, if you if you're going into battle and you've and you've got this bulky stuff, your maneuverability on the battlefield um, is restricted. And the other thing as well is um, the whole point of having fairly long swords and fairly long axes is so nobody ever gets close to you. So if they get close, you're dead anyway. So you're not going to need the helmet. So I know some of you would agree or disagree with me, but when when we always see the portrayals portrayals of Vikings. Um, some of them are to be seen in a mythological sense and a legendary sense, and you can make of it as you will. So make of it as you will. But let's go away from the military side of things. Let's get back to what we're talking about, Ragnarok as well. If you look at the uh, prow and aft of a vessel, the front and the back of a ve vessel, you see these, these, these sort of very monstrous beasts looking out to the sea. Uh, these, these are a representation of the, the, the sense of their tradition, the sense of their culture, of the sense of who they are, the sense of Ragnarok, the sense of, of serpents, and the sense of a story. If you look at close, if you look into close detail, um, I don't know if any of you have actually seen that absolutely fantastic film, um, which is a Norwegian film um, called Ragnarok. Have you have actually seen that? And there's a Hollywood film, which is crap. Well, anyway, look, look it up. This film Ragnarok is brilliant. They, 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 and it, the weird thing is, um, they base it on actual archaeology. So there's an archaeologist uh, who is doing a very irresponsible thing. He takes his children out into a very dangerous area to try and excavate the archaeology, and very weird things start to happen. A typical um, irresponsible thing for a, an archaeological uh, dad to do with their children. Take them everywhere, put them at risk, which I've done. Um, and, uh, and all that is based upon the legend of Ragnarok. And the legend of Ragnarok, you can see that the reason why these are all intertwined is not just a, it's not just a load of beasts intertwined to look good. It's a story. It's actually a story. It's meant to say, tell you a story. Right, OK. OK, you, uh, go on, Chris. I'm not saying this is what you're thinking, but you could, Chris could be thinking, how can that be a story? OK, then Santa Claus. You know the story of Santa Claus? Yeah? Man. Yeah, you can, if you say Santa Claus, you know the full story, okay? Somebody's laughing at something which I'm not getting in the room, but, but, but by looking at this representation, you could unravel where all the sort of, um, where all the directions of all the interweave, the knot work and everything's going, and all the little beast heads and all the rest of it, you could put it together into a story. That's exactly what we do with Santa Claus. That's, that's exactly what we do um, with, with the, um, all the other, I can't think of any at this minute, fairies, and we all think, when we, when we have a representation of a witch, we think, oh my God, that's an evil person who was on a broomstick, right? So this is a whole sense of what um, these carvings are about. You're going, you're going out to sea. You on the boat know what that head means, know what that representation means. You know everything on it, right? As you go into a foreign country, nobody knows what that means, but you do, and it's a very powerful symbol. Very powerful symbol. Again, Easter, Easter eggs, for example, very powerful symbol. Um, Easter bunny, all these things. But if you put an Easter bunny in front of somebody who didn't know what Easter <laughs> bunny was about, they would think, yes, yeah, an Easter bunny. It's exactly the same direction with this. If you get a little bit of information, you can understand uh, their art is their language, it's their projection. It's not just about runes and things like that. It's their projection. It's who they are. That's what art is. I am what this is saying. So, Chris, want, go on, tell me what Chris is saying. Well, go on, tell, tell me what it means. Then. Go on, go on. <laughs> oh, don't worry, Chris. I'm, I'm picking on you in a nice way, <laughs> unlike Lynn, who I just um, um, so, so, so here we go. Um, Tia, Frey, uh, we've got Odin, we've got Thor, we've got the representations of gods, we've got these, these, these bears, for example, we've got 
We've got a few, a few sort of uh, mortal people on a boat being sort of held up out of the water um, by Frey, for example. Loki, the dog's up here, and this is actually, this could be the scene of Ragnarok, where the beasts are actually going for the gods, and they're trying to help humans, and humans are trying to help the gods, and it's a bit of a mess. In what, in what society um, do we actually have real Armageddon myths um, that, that they really believed in? They believed in Armageddon, they believed in the end of the world. It was part of who they were. You've got to keep going as a Viking, man or woman. Uh, the gods are with you, and you are with the gods. When you, when you think about, um, I know this is an Anglo-Saxon um, uh, work, uh, Beowulf, for example, uh, but it's, it's all about sort of gods and people and mortals and immortals. Um, and, and weirdly enough, when we look at Beowulf, as we did the other week, um, we see that, they're, that they've actually found the location, the hall where Beowulf is meant to have taken place, and the heroes of Beowulf and so on. Um, and so you start to think that actually that there might be um, something in all this stuff. Beasts that are, are, are actually out at sea. Um, how, how the landscape works are, are not... And, and one, one thing, it's an interesting point, of, this is an interesting point that I've taken on board over the last few days. Um, did you know, throughout history, um, there, there are about 50 species of beasts that go extinct every single day, okay? When I say species, you know, subspecies and all the rest of it, 50 individual types of ge genus, of uh, geni actually going extinct every single day, 50 individual things, whatever. So one type of frog being wiped out, one type of this, every single day, yeah? Um, and in a thousand years, in a thousand two hundred years, in a thousand three hundred years, four hundred years, since these myths and legends have actually been written down, there may have actually been, um, sort of beasts, um, um, like the Loch Ness Monster and weird sort of bears and so on, that have become extinct. To them, they were great mythical beasts. Um, you know, for example, you go, you go in woods and, and you, you see uh, luminescence creatures running around, for example, you're thinking, this is really weird, this is fairies. Well, one, day, one day at night, I remember um, um, sleeping next to a trench that... Um, we had, we were actually digging foundations for this house. We cut into this trench, and all the roots of the tr all the roots of the plants uh, were luminescent. You could actually see in the in the dark with these luminescent l roots. Right? That is just weird. That's something of the gods. So I'm not saying that um, these gods existed, but some of the creatures associated with these myths and legends may have existed, because if all these creatures are going extinct every single day. How do we know that some of these creatures didn't exist in the past? There's a very important point there. Ragnarok. Things that go bump in the night. Got a question. Go for it. Is Ragnarok a bloke or is it a place? Or it, it's a story. A story. It's a story. It's, 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 it's an event. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the end of the world. It's the gods being taken down. It's men and women being taken down. It's the beasts tearing into other beasts. It's the beasts tearing into the gods. Is, is men and women supporting the gods, the, the gods helping men and women, it's complete Armageddon, it's complete collapse of absolutely everything. And some people believe um, that the sense of Armageddon, um, mm -hmm. the sense of Ragnarok, Ragnarok was a prediction of the Vikings, the, the complete collapse of civilization, um, and not being a soothsayer or anything like that, you might feel that we as advanced human beings have got everything on our doorstep and we use it for our own destruction. Ragnarok. Um, the sense of the downfall of the Asir uh, in, in, a, in the piece of artwork that you see, all, all these people, all, all the sort of the hordes coming through, Ragnarok is a representation of, of complete, maybe Ragnarok is evil, maybe it, it's good, come to take away evil. It's whatever you want it to be. It's a beast. It, it's it's a, a god gone wrong. It's, it's a bear hitting into everybody. That's Ragnarok. So it can't be really specific. It's an event. And even, even, even the sense of their idea of Ragnarok, Farwald's cross um, on the Isle of Man, um, Farwald's cross is a Christian cross with the representation of Ragnarok, the representation of Armageddon. Um, so they always feared. And the Vikings have, had every right to fear. They're going out into the oceans and the seas. 
A ship may go out, may never ever return. Nobody knows what the answer why it never returned. Was it a beast out at sea? Was it a huge actual octopus that overtook the ship? Did everyone have, uh, were everyone taken down because they had eaten some infected grain and all ended up with uh, ergot and they, they killed each other? Maybe they all went nuts and rang the rock. Uh, and when you look at the Vikings as well, um, you see them as being indestructible. The Vikings could never ever de be defeated. But what we do see in, a, in the actual archaeology is that the Vikings were defeated time and time again. When you, you look, for example, at Weymouth, um, near Weymouth Harbour, they, they, they excavated 300 Viking individuals. I don't know if anyone worked out they were all men or women. I don't care. But there were 50 Viking, uh, not 50 Viking individuals. I was thinking of another one then. Uh, uh, 300 Viking individuals. Um, 300 of them, 300, massive figure. Every single one of these Vikings had been beheaded. They had all been beheaded, 300 of them. And they were all blokes. Yeah. Um, and there wasn't quite enough heads. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the main point is, whether they're men, women, or not interested, the fact of the matter is, um, they had all been beheaded, 300 of them. Right, that was a Viking army. That was a considerably large Viking army, and they were all dead. In fact, when we think about our local landscape, when we think about the Roman villa at Lantwit Major, when they found those 33 bodies out of the, the I think we're, we're up to about 40 odd bodies at Lantwit Major, uh, 33 of them had all been beheaded. I know this is not the Viking period, this is hundreds of years before the Vikings ever uh, thought of and come to Britain, but this is a group of people who are not genetically from this area, they get off their boats, they come inland and they're all massacred. History has always written that the Vikings, we, we, that, that basically, history has always written that the Vikings, the Anglo-Saxons come over and all the rest of it, forget the Romans on this because I've got my own views on that, um, they come over and everybody's a walkover. But that's not the case in the archaeology. The case in the archaeology is that the Vikings uh, were as vulnerable to being wiped out as we were. Ragnarok. It's all coming to that. They had fears. They feared the same fears that we had. Uh, but they were able to explain their fears. And that is an important piece of information. When you're able to explain your fears, there are things... That destroy us. When you've got people who are very vulnerable turning to Christianity for answers and uh, Christianity isn't giving them any answers, you become very vulnerable because Christianity is a relatively new religion as it develops in the four, five hundred, six hundred and seven hundred. The sense of Ragnarok has always been there. You see Ragnarok around you every single day. Um, and this is why um, Viking civilization is much more powerful than every single civilization is coming across. It's a very powerful civilization because it's always got the answers. We will go into battle as if we're going to be able to go, uh, go alongside Odin or Thor or, or any of these gods up there. We're able to, we're able to sort of progress. Um, Christianity doesn't give those answers. And I'm talking about trying to understand those answers, but they understood them if you understand what I'm talking about. I mean, like, uh, you've got some runic script here, but we're not really doing runes today either, so let's move on. Um, so here we go, a little bit of information about Ragnarok, Rock, Rock, I know you can't read that. Ragnarok, cataclysmic description of the cosmos and everything in it. So it's not just the gods, it's not just the people, but absolutely everything. This says even the gods. In what epic does the god, are the gods destroyed? Do, do you see all those um, rulers um, at Olympia? Um, Zeus, for example, and Athena, do they ever get wiped out in a great epic? Um, but in, in North mythology, they do. When we say Norse mythology, we mean Viking mythology. We mean the Scandinavian world. The story of Ragnarok naturally comes at the very end uh, of their tales, uh, tale telling. Because it's the end of a tale. It's the end of an epic. Like Mahabharat, it's the end. The end. In Mahabharat, for example... Uh, that great Hindu um, where, where you see gods 
who have to be killed with, with thousands and thousands of arrows to be killed. That's, you know, and people keep firing the arrows at the god to kill the gods, for example. This is what we're talking about, Ragnarok. We've got to get rid of the gods. We've got to get rid of everything, the cosmos and everything in it. We've got to destroy it, everything. It's a, it's a set of unspecified and unknown um, time predictions for the future, some believe. Um, and it's, it's those great ramif ramifications. Ragnarok can be described as meaning the fate of the gods. <coughs> Other people believe that the word Ragnarok means the twilight of the gods, the end of the gods, the event is also occasionally referred to as the fate of mankind and a host of other names. In fact, the fate of mankind is intrinsically linked with the gods because we would not be there here if it wasn't for the gods. You look at ancient Egyptian civilization, the gods are responsible for our existence. Is there semen <laughs> that comes down to the earth to give us our existence? Is, is, is God that allows Adam and Eve, for example, if we look at Christianity. It's, it's, it's all that. This is how important the gods are and their representation to the Vikings is set as you nail, flay somebody's skin onto a church door somewhere in Britain. So there we go. The art itself is the beast, and the beast itself is within the art, and this is all intertwined. <coughs> look at that as it's all intertwined. Um, it, it's such, if you can just follow that, in fact, it's labyrinthial. Uh, because at the end of the labyrinth, you get somewhere. That's the end of the story. You've got to start somewhere as well, so you've got to find the beginning. It's like opening a book halfway through and thinking, right, I will eventually read the beginning. I've done that. You, you read a book halfway through and you've gone this way, and then you go that way, and you meet it all together, and eventually you can understand it. Uh, but sometimes some of these epics can't be told in that way. They, they've got, be, got, got to be told um, with understanding what we're looking at. So um, we, we're looking at this, this wonderful carving here. You can find them um, in ivory. You can find them in um, uh, uh, um, sort of bone. You can find them in wood, for example. Really couldn't do this in stone. Couldn't do this in pottery. Where you've got silver being added, you've got precious stones being added, and it goes through, and that, they've done a bit of reconstruction there. Ellen? Sorry, just like that, the Chinese carving, you know, the chains and the ivory and all that. All that. We just look at it. in the middle, and it, it just kind of sits. Does it? Very mm. Intricate. Intricate. Yeah, Intricately yeah, moved. Well, woven. The, the crown head as well, that was the same one as the crown head. Wasn't it? And the thing is, we get these things from abroad, and you plonk down the table, oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? We don't have uh, no idea what we're looking at. It's the same as people having tattoos abroad saying, um, they go into a, um, a tattooist and said, oh, I want something saying, I love Jenny, when it, in fact it says, you are, you know? I know, like that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you don't know what, you know, what you're given on the table from somebody coming from Thailand or somewhere else. Might might be actually there might be an evil spell associated with it. it. Might be it might be talking about your own downfall or whatever. Because you've given these things, you don't really understand the culture. You don't understand the context. The Viking world is about context. Is about following that context and really getting into the depth of the context. This itself is a Higgelsey treasure. Uh, this was actually found in Germany, and a Higgelsey treasure itself. Uh, uh, when I, I know we're not talking about. A massive load of gold, um, something like the Staffordshire Hoard. But something like the Staffordshire Hoard, um, there are base metals associated with the Staffordshire Hoard. So you get a brooch, you get a base metal of bronze or something, or an alloy, and on top of that you get gilt, okay? Um, or you might have, have attachments of gold or something. But these are actually solid gold. These are these are hundred and one percent gold. Um, these, these are gold in its finest. This is from, um, this is from Germany. And as you look at, look, at, look at this, that particular symbol there, that symbol itself um, may be associated with a leader. The, you know, we, we, we did that number three a while ago, and the number four, and all the representations and numbers and stuff. So th this could actually be worn as some kind of chest plate or a brooch by a man or a woman. Uh, immediately when this was found, it was immediately associated with the woman. But why can't it be associated with the man? And you're thinking, right, like, just it, it's gold, it's really important, it's special. Um, and this would have been connected with a chain around your neck. Um, and again, this is an absolutely beautiful treasure. 
found in Germany. Um, this is one of the finest sets of, of gold, proper gold, solid gold treasures found anywhere throughout the Viking world. Um, and it's the best of the best. And the gold work there is so fine. And I'm going to make a statement here. Um, and this is very much related. When you look at the areas where there are Jewish craftsmen, for example, the lowlands, Netherlands, and sort of going sort of maybe over to Denmark, sort of the coastal plain, going all the way from sort of northwestern Europe, you get a lot of um, Jewish craftsmen, okay? And it's in exactly those same, same areas where you've got the Viking craftsmen. And you're thinking simply that the Jewish community is just slipping in to taking over the skill of the silversmiths of the Viking world because the Jewish craftsmen we know are great silversmiths and maybe that's been adopted from the Vikings. Interesting link there. Moving on, the beautiful goldsmiths back to the Vikings and silversmiths. Um, all, all their work seems to be brilliant except for their coins. So the Hiddlesea treasure itself, uh, we, we're looking at this, look at how intricate that is um, and if we, if we go here, <coughs> solid, solid gold with five precious stones. And this is all interwoven uh, with these nice pellets here, the, the knot work, and this is all on a, this is on a gold base. This is no undercarriage base, this is solid gold. If you melted this down, uh, you would be able to take it to the Royal Mint and I've put it to the, um, your, your gold collection there. This is 100%. This is except for those stones on it. It's said about the Hiddlesea treasure uh, was found in 1873 on the tiny German island of Hiddlesea um, in the Black Sea. Um, it's the most stunning archaeological finds and considered the largest discovery of Viking jewellery in Germany of that quality. It's not in the Black Sea. Baltic Sea, sorry, I brushed that. <laughs> See, I was just <laughs> testing you all there. <laughs> Baltic wow. Sea. There you are, we were awake. Or good, 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 good. <laughs> Ellen spotted it as well. And Ellen. Uh, it is supposed to be manufactured in about the 900s, the late Viking Age, and is connected with the nobility of southern Scandinavia. Um, and maybe a very, um, very famous king, the King um, Harald Gorsud, uh, better known as Harald Bluetooth which I'm sure some of you will have come across. Mm -hmm. who, who probably didn't have blue teeth at all, and probably oh, well, some other colour. There was something about us in the Viking burials. They found a tooth that, that, that had got, got scratches and stuff off, and they did do things with their teeth. They filed off bits and put... Mm. Blue tooth? Yeah. You know, jewellery or whatever. Yeah. Do, do, you know, do you know the other? He probably was blue tooth. So exactly. Yeah. Well, actually, when, when they say... Um, when they say um, Eric the bon Boneless or something, it, it, it's sort of either the Boneless, I, I, either the boneless. So I was just <laughs> testing you. Uh, I need to move on. There's sometimes these associations are, um, are to, to be turned around. So if you, if you see, if you see descriptions, I'm making a mess of this, you see descriptions of, of um, Eric Longhair, it was because he was bald. Mm. Uh, so anyway, moving on, moving on. Here, yeah, you. Well, so, how do we look at this oh, mythological beast? It looks a bit like Lynn on a good day. I had to get that in there. It's quite cute. So, it's quite cute, isn't it? It is quite cute. But the, that that is obviously, um, it might be a representation, maybe not of a raven, maybe of something like a crow or some a mythical beast that <coughs> you put in there. But again, this is all intertwined. Each of these probably tells an individual story. You know, you know when we when we're children, we have that sort of um, that, that that sort of bracelet with all those little things hanging on. You know the one? Child bracelet. Child bracelet. Yeah. So each of those little things represents something. Yeah. So this is exactly what we're saying. You know what that little donkey on there looks like, or that little leg. You know what that uh, means, and what this means, and what that should look like, and all the rest of it. Each of those tells a story, individual to that person. And this is what this may have told, an individual story, individual to that person. It's only that person who can actually tell you what these things mean. Come on, get knackered now. Anyway, uh, altogether, the treasure consists of a brooch, uh, a neck ring, 14 pendants, all made of pure gold, weighing a total of 1.3 pounds. It's 
quite a lot of gold, really. More than you've got in the bank, uh, Steve. Um, the largest pendants are made with braided bands. The others show bead knot work and great graduation um, ornaments uh, created by mixing little gold splinters with charcoal in a crucible. Um, no, no other Hindlesey type uh, jewelry has been found before. So this is fairly unique, and they look like birds with beaks, whether they're owls. Uh, whether, whether an eagle or something like a crow but obviously this, this tells a story associated with the individual who's actually wearing it again let's quick look at this um, now, it's, now the piece of said this was made in the workshop of Harold Blue Bluetooth um, but again absolutely beautiful but I obviously need to move on now um, a little more look at these again oh go on I, I know Lynn wants to you know, see one of these pieces again I was going to say something, Len, but you might get really upset about looking into a mirror. Um, sorry. <laughs> Len, what do you think? I'm just thinking I'm glad I'm going to miss the next two uh, lectures. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where are you going? <laughs> I'm invigilating. Oh, you are, aren't you? I thought you were invigilating today. I didn't. No, I'm not today. Right. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Len, what do you um, think? Does that look beautiful? It's Checking people taking it is, it is, it is. Oh, yeah. right, the yeah. teacher. Yeah. So he didn't go to school, so he wouldn't know anything about that? No. No, I was in the sixth form, but I didn't do any work. It was actually on my report. Does, <laughs> does Stephen realise he has to do work? So I used to go to art, put my feet up, and re read his digest for two years. <laughs> <laughs> I only went because I didn't know what to do in my life, so I thought I'd stay in school for a year. And I did absolutely bugger all. <laughs> well, fair enough. Best, best year in school ever. Most, <laughs> most people do that in Lantwick, because there's nothing to do. So there you go, moving on. Um, we're gonna we're gonna look at the Sutton Who bit and then we're gonna have a break and go on. Mm. And we'll have the raffle afterwards as well. Um, now Sutton Who, there it is for for the likes of Ellen. There's Sutton Who, there it is. Um, I know, right, Kathy? Can I just get this out of my system straight away? Somebody told me that you had plans on the Colchester trip to go somewhere. Where is it? You, you, you don't ask, know. I did ask if we could go to the um, oh, the, uh, the constitution at the church. The, the wooden one. No, Stonewall. Oh, Saint Peter's at um, yes, Brad, Brad, Bradwell. Bradwell. Right. Okay. I'll write. Inside a Roman thingy. That's right, Brad. I I will think about it, but it it, it might be a bit sort of off, but you know. Um, whether I'm taking my car or not, you and I could drive off there and see her. Hang on a minute. I don't want to interfere in what I do with um, Kathy. Yeah, all right, it's Roman, okay, all right. Okay, so set who? Quick, set who? Now, there, there's the. We, we see another illustration of set who uh, ship there is the largest mound excavated by Basil Brown. Uh, in 1938-1939, um, 1939, the excavations um, had to stop because of the war, but the excavations were, were quite complete. Um, and we're, we're looking at um, we, whether it's a man or a woman, the association of this, this wonderful work, this wonderful treasure that was found as certain who has always lived, um, lived up to its legend whenever you see the collection of work in the British Museum. Um, and there, there, there it is. They, um, you, you can see the ribs there. there. Basically, um, the sand itself has filled the void of the rotten wood. Um, as they, when they excavated it, they actually found all the little um, iron rivets all the way along, uh, and obviously the complete shape. And there's where the ship burial was. There's, a, there's, the, it was ninety nine percent intact. So obviously, there'd been little bur burrowing and so on. One weird thing about some of the Viking treasures that we see is that um, it's almost as if people have been saying, oh, there's a Viking treasure over there, there's gold over there, right? People have just left it. A bit like certain who. Um, and what we do, we're like the um, like the Osberg ship. It was like, oh, right, there's a, there's a burial of a ship over there. It's just full of gold. We'll just leave it. 99% um, of the time, when anyone ever mentions gold, people always seem to go over and gig it up and destroy it. But we saw some examples last week of uh, the Rillerton um, gold cup 
um, and the Mole Cape, where, where there were legends of something buried and nobody ever bothered with it. They were found by absolute accident. So some of the very best stuff in the Viking world has been found because people knew there was something there and they left it there. Um, it's like at the end of the rainbow there's gold and none of us are going to go over and find it. So last week we looked at lots of accidental finds but the very best of the, the, the Viking stuff was, you know, we knew it was there and eventually somebody excavated it. Um, but anyway, going back to the Sutton Hoo ship burial. Um, there's, there's all the mounds at Sutton Hoo. Um, you can see that there's little dimples. Lots of these have been sort of um, excavated into uh, when they were working at Sutton Hoo. Um, and, and there is the helmet. Now, the design itself um, and, and the materials actually are, are originally from Sweden. But people still convinced that it's, it's an Anglo-Saxon burial and everything on it is from Sweden. Again, you've got that dichotomy. But I'm saying it's Viking because um, it might be a burial associated with a prince of the royal, royal house of Sweden um, at Sutton Hoo. The, the ship was dragged um, about 500 uh, metres from the river up to, a, up to the top of the hill. So, so you know, the, people, the person buried there could look out onto the landscape. And just because the helmet, when they, when they found it, was in a very decayed, broken state, it may have been in a bad state when they had when the helmet was buried with the individual. Um, and you're thinking, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Um, certain who ship burial sword. No, the sword wasn't perfect. It looked like it, it was broken before it had been placed into the, 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 um, uh, the ship, before it, the man was put on top of it. The helmet looked like it had been broken before um, it was buried with the, with the individual. And to be honest with you, when you go into the afterlife, it's better to go into the afterlife with items that are broken. Simply because if you're a good if you're a good enough warrior, you can reforge your sword. Um, you can reforge your sword to fight alongside Odin and Thor um, in the great epic of Ragnarok. Some people say you've got to go um, into the afterlife um, brandishing a sword, but it doesn't need to be a sword. Um, There's a perfect sword because if you if you are any good as a warrior, um, you are going to be good enough to act as your own smithy uh, and you're able to reforge your sword and um, those that know what I'm talking about here if any of you have actually um, loved the books The Lord of the Ring you'll see um, I think it's The Coming of the King in the third book it's, it's um, Return. <coughs> Return of the King mm -hmm. where the forge the, the sword is reforged the sword yeah. the sword yes um, and that has come back that has come through from us the Shards the Viking of mythology, yeah, um, because J.R.R. Tolkien um, was was a, a scholar of the Anglo-Saxon and Viking world, and he took all these little snippets and put them in a book. So that's yeah. where he got the reforging of the sword. He actually invented the Elven language, didn't he? It is a mm -hmm. living, well, it's not a living language, because it's never used, but potentially. It is when you go to Lord of the Ring conferences. Oh, yeah, I bet it is, yeah. It's uh, Alan's an expert in it. It's like... Uh, Trekkies who speak Klingon, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> They've got new stuff in Valhalla anyway. I had a dream once. I went there. <laughs> and it's all, it's all, that was all modern day stuff. Drunk in dream. No, they were putting in a security detail. I said, look, I'm, I'm an old geezer and I've got much good to you. He said, well, that doesn't matter up here. And it was all like in modern day setting, like locker rooms and stuff. <laughs> it's the spirit we want, not your physical you know, sort of mm -hmm. the, the swords were all that they knew to be used in. Anyway. Well, that's probably yeah, how we invented in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I know where I'm going. I'm the influence, you see, you get anywhere. Do you know, do you know what, right? That's a brilliant story. I tell you what, well, I'm in a pub with you one day, but I want to hear more of that story because that sounds absolutely tape. fantastic. You have to delete that off the tape, though. <laughs> There's always tape going. Yeah, always. Um, anyway, um, I, I, you completely shocked me. I don't know what to say. Let's just get to the end of the certain who thing. I'm, this is a great. This is a great golden buckle. Um, found a certain who, um, and whenever when it was found, obviously you've got something that's sort of more Anglo-Saxon uh, looking, um, but you've got the cloison pasted again. Deliberately got that wrong, so you can correct me. Um, on 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 the gold itself, um, you've you've got this. 
which is known as um, the, the purse, or the great purse, also found at Sutton Hoo. And you can see um, there are two beasts gnawing at the head of an individual. Again, the stereotypical representation of Ragnarok, the beasts. Uh, and obviously on the purse, the, the gold, with a sort of wonderful enamel inlay here as well. Uh, and this, again, found at Sutton Hoo. Does this belong to a man or a woman? I'm not really interested. It belonged to an individual, a human being. Uh, and which was highly influenced by the Viking world. And obviously, this burial dates to around, okay, some believe it dates from about 620 on, 628, 640-odd body of evidence, uh, which is about 150-odd years before the Vikings ever properly get to Britain. But it's full of um, Swedish material, um, and it might be a Swedish prince again. So there you go. This is why it gets very confusing. Uh, there's a shield there. Um, well, what we have, we've got, we've got a, either a leather um, cladding, um, a wooden background with all these adornments. So you've got the shield uh, boss here and, and all these adornments, all the little rivets and stuff. This is in gold, again, lots of uh, mythological things on this. Um, again, the certain who burial, there's a bit of a display, that's the British Museum. The, the axe, the sword. Uh, the broken sword to be reforged. There you go, there's a bit of a play on words. Um, and what we don't need to do is go any further, but what I can say is that the Sutton Hoo burial itself, uh, the ship has, from the time of its discovery, prompted comparisons with the world described in the heroic old English poem Berulf, which is set in southern Sweden. Um, it's also the, the ship burial itself, X38 38, 39, um, by a very um, interested landowner um, who funded the excavation. Uh, they also found the, the helmet, which we've mentioned, lots of gold and gems, um, pieces of silver plate from Byzantium, other objects. Um, it was a wonderful collection um, and a wonderful representation of one of 12, uh, of 20 burials, earthen mounds that we know about at Sutton Hoo. Um, and what we're going to do, this after the break, the Coppergate helmet found at York, um, the, your Urvik Viking Centre. So are there any questions? Jorvik. Urvik. You went to York. Urvik. Lynn, repeat after me. Urvik. Exactly. Um, right, so what we're going to do, we're going to take a break. Um, are there any questions? Did you say that's the Waterloo helmet? No, the, the, the yeah. Coppergate yeah. helmet. Oh, ah, the Eurovic. Yeah. Okay. Eurovic. That's the um, Anglo-Saxon way of saying it. <laughs> so we're all right in the room. It's good to be all right. And the Welshman. Um, Evrock. <coughs> oh, we, 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 we see, it's, it's like a triangle today. It's working. We won't, we won't spoil it there. If anyone wants these eggs... Um, let me know the, the ducks. The ducks, um, you know, our I, I, um, oh, good old Gertrude. She she lays the biggest eggs. So if any, I'll go around the room. Any monies for events and stuff? Let me know. Usual monies, eggs. No more questions. Let's have a break. And what I'm going to do? I'm going to I'm going to envelop the story that we were told by Peter. <laughs> so. Right. Come on, Daddy. I thought it was me. <laughs> oh, are you upset now? Yes. You. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to a pizza. No. Um, anyway, this is the Coppergate helmet, right? So we're going to go up until 22. So we're going to do 17 more minutes. So. So this is a copper gate helmet. This is all. This is found at um, um, Irvik, Jorvik, York, um, Evrog, uh, or whatever names you want to give York. The fact of the matter is, York itself. If you want to think about um, technology and you want to think about civilization, you've got to visit it when you're looking at the archaeology, the art of the Vikings in Britain. And um, the copper gate helmet itself, <coughs> it's 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 a utilitarian piece. It, it's a protective piece. Um, it, it's it's within the um, it's within the genre of an art form, um, and there is art associated with it. Um, if we could, if we look at that there, 
can't see it again, but if we look at that there, you have this really beautiful knot work and scroll work. You don't need to have this on there, okay? And um, this, this is naturally, um, this, is, this is gold work as well on um, an iron background. So a sword is just gonna clonk on your nose and it's just gonna collapse. So this is not for protection. It can't be for it's, protection. It's, uh, think about missiles with helmets though. It's still, you know, it's not just like axes or swords that get worn off. It's like stuff flying through the air. Is it helpful? But, but, but the other thing as well is, right, here we go. If you've got a thick leather, leather helmet, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. a bodkin um, is gonna be more protection. Yeah, the peasants had uh, leather and stuff. Exactly, exactly. But the point is, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is if you get too close, if you get too close to this helmet, you're too close anyway. That's the point. Yeah, but, yeah. but again, the bodkins and stuff. What I'm trying to say is, that I'm going to move on from this. I'm trying to say that art itself is, is massively, highly influential in, in the Viking thinking. It's just to, what this, this is a message. This, this reads something. Not, no, not knowing what it reads, there's, there's codices to actually read these things. And, and the Scandinavian archaeologists are actually going so far to try and read it a little bit more. Right, away from the Coppergate um, helmet, over to the Osberg ship. The Osberg ship itself was an absolute sensation when it was found in Norway. But it's an interesting sensation again. This is one of those sites that was excavated over 100 years ago, and they knew it was there. Uh, they just chose not to dig it up and to destroy it. We've got evidence of Viking vessels being found elsewhere in Britain, but unfortunately they w the work was done by British archaeologists um, and all the information has been lost. So then we look at something like the Osberg vessel. Um, so you've got the, that's it in, it's all, that's, that works quite well. This is it in this ground, the pro and aft itself, the headgear on either side uh, was actually preserved in some way, state or form. You can see the absolute beautiful preservation there. Bit like the Nimi boats that was excavated by um, Mussolini's archaeologists from late, late Diana, late Nimi. Absolutely perfect, but they were from the Roman period, perfect state of preservation. This is also in a perfect state of preservation. What was really important is actually the scroll work uh, on the keel going all the way through. Um, and again, they, they, it was protection, it, it was a message, it was a story. You're going out with a story. You're going out with your representation, your civilization, who you are mm. within the scroll work. It's the same as somebody having a mobile phone. It's your representation. It's not mine because um, I, I have a really naff mobile phone. But some people keep their lives on it. Goff and Jane have got mobile phones with all their photographs on it. If they lose those mobile phones, uh, it loses their identity. And this is the ship as well. Um, it's, it's an identity. But when you burn the ship, um, there's something else going on there. When you just when you you're not destroying something, you're allowing the ship to go on to the rest of its journey, for the scroll work to evaporate into the ether, to go on to a new story, into a new plane. Um, so the scroll work here, the power and not not the not the big sort of Ragnarok sort of head gears that you would associate with these vessels. But then again, this is a symbol. This is frightening enough. Uh, the Osberg ship itself in Norway, Vestfold, um, Osberg, the Osberg farm, on display in the Viking Ship Museum. They've got a Viking Ship Museum because they got more than one Viking ship there. Uh, the mound itself was well known and through the likes of the Scandinavian world, mounds themselves were being protected from a very early age within um, legislation in the likes of Norway. Um, from 1807, they had archeological sites that were being, um, uh, um, that, that's Denmark actually, but not Norway itself um, is within that ilk. Uh, their, their sites were being protected from an early age like Denmark that had legislation that protected mounds and trees and archeological remains. So the reason why the ship itself has been preserved up until the excavation of 1904 because it was protected. Nobody could dig it. Nobody could destroy it. It was mm. there. You knew there was something in that mound, treasure or not. It could not be protected. It could not be destroyed and looted. People have got that respect. They know they know that mound is protected. So when archaeologists come around in 1904, they find an intact ship that hasn't been interfered with. Uh, so we have there. We have this is this is below the waterline. Is this wood? Or? This is wood. 
this is below the waterline. This is this is so as as the as the ship rises out the waves, it's it's occasionally being revealed. It, it's sort of it's the journey, the, the the actual water, the interweave with the wood, the actual the actual story itself. There's a beast come out of the water as it's going through the waves, right in the waves. That's all part of the epic. This is the epic itself. Um, so being excavated by Swedish archaeologists, it's it's twenty nearly twenty two meters in length. Um, old language, 70 foot long. It's fairly wide. It's, um, it's just over five meters wide. Um, and it's, it, the, the masks themselves, that they've actually found, um, were up to 10 meters in height. So it, the, the sails that they're, they're guesstimating um, had an area, if this makes any sense to anybody, 90 square meters. Um, and it could do, it could do um, 10 knots when it was fully um, when the sails were up, two sails, not just the one. Um, it's likely using one sail would, would be a lot better than using two, but I'm not a naval person. It had 15 pairs, one second, it had 15 <coughs> pairs of um, oar holes um, on either side, meaning that there was 30 people in the boat um, quickly. But they'd be very, very fast compared to normal boats in brackets in those days as well. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, and when the when it was actually um, excavated, um, they they were able the way they did it um, was they actually raised the thing they, they put it on a they put it on bo a bogies and a rail track and it just the the whole thing went into the museum on its last journey into the museum on a track. It, yeah, guiding in, they just glid in. We've got we got an image of that. It's it's beautiful. It's clinker built, if that, um, which is overlapping. Um, and the skeletons of two men or women, <coughs> women, two women uh, were found found in the grave within the ship. Two women. Now this is interesting. One was believed one was believed to be um, in excess of eighty years old. People died when they were 30 back then. No, they bloody didn't. She was 80 years old. She had arthritis and other uh, bits and pieces. And the other one was probably maybe in their, in her 30s. And they, and they used to say that the other one in her 30s was sacrificed to accompany the other person, the 80-year-old, into the afterlife. But then they worked out that, um, that the younger woman had a collarbone break um, that um, seemed to um, recover and then probably out of infection, it, it, she, she died naturally, so it wasn't a sacrifice. Somewhere, um, somewhere in about, um, the grave dates from about the 830s, 834, somewhere like that, the, the, the ship was constructed in about the 800s, so it was only out at sea for the maximum length of, say, about 30 odd years. But the interesting thing with the amount of craftsmanship involved with the Osberg ship, craftsmanship, um, I, you can imagine the archaeologist just standing there on a plank as it goes into the museum. I wouldn't. Um, and, and there's Gillian at, the, um, Gillian at the back, you see. Gillian at the back there, sort of with her Viking armour on, with her, and there's me at the front. Gillian will enter the museum! See, I'm, I've, I've undone that now, all the, all the hassle I've given you today. And, and it's on the track going into the museum. They love, they love their archaeology. They, they, they love, in Scandinavia, they love their archaeology and they, they treat it finely and they respect it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get a railway track being built in the street um, to have the Mary Rose going along. There'd be so many objections. Um, and, and there it is, there's the, when the archaeologists are excavating, you can see how perfect that is. They, they must have thought that the Vikings were coming. The Vikings were coming home when the, the ship entered the museum. And in, interestingly enough, we, 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 we're getting close to the end actually oh we don't want to see that no there's my son Owen there he is he looks at, he looks like a bit bit like a dodgy mass murderer um, and so what we're going to do now we're going to quickly look at these items um, and if I can um, do this don't get too confused right so we're going to look at that one there this is where technology comes in as long as I don't get hoodooed by somebody in the room right I won't mention Lynn's name um, everything will go fine Oh, Lynn, I love you lots, and I'm going to miss you. Um, 
So, so here we go. Um, as as we go through, Lewis chess chessman, uh, berserkers, berserker figures found on the Isle of Lewis, um, Uig, um, of the um, the Western Isles of Scotland. Um, this itself, Pride in Place, a number of these figures actually found um, more than just one chess set. Viking period again, with their large shields, um, miserably looking figures. Um, and then the next, the next image itself, here we go, ivory. Thank you for asking that. Oh, hang on a minute, Kathy, help me. Well, it was now, wasn't it? Walrus. Walrus, walrus ivory, yeah. Walrus ivory, yeah. Walrus. Um, so, uh, it might have been unicorn. This, this, guess what this is? What's that? Told this, this is the beginning. Actually, I was lying. I was lying. It's an ear spoon. Oh, an ear spoon. <laughs> an ear spoon. Ba basic. Wax yeah, basic. <laughs> basically, I get the end of the spoon right um, in the house and I scrape the stuff out of my ears. Yeah. I do that on a regular Which basis. Is the end? It's very naughty. Um, that there, it's there. <laughs> that was the spoon. That was the point. No, it's, no, it's, it's rounded. It's rounded. Just push it in one side and bring it out the other. Yeah, bring it out the other, yeah, yeah. Shut up, you Utah. That dates from about the 900s. We, we, it's we, an eagle. Yeah. We, 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 we've done this from the Hiddle Sea Horde from Germany, but what we want to do now is number four, because Gillian's into number four. She likes the number four, right? Whenever she's out, right, she always has to have five pints of dak. Um, um, anyway. So, um... Six. <laughs> no, four, it has to be four. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I'm confused now. Move right. on, move on. A copper alloy pin. This is a, a pin, obviously, for your hair or, or, your, or your cloak or your tunic. This, this is also from Germany. This dates from about... Lots of these stuff date from about the 900s, right? About um, year 1000, because that's when that's when the, the Viking world is, is, is height, really. You've got King Canute in 1016, um, who's, who's actually the Viking uh, ruler of Britain. Um, you're probably correct, but I think it was 1016 to 1036, something like that. Anyway, the next one um, is um, just, just we can't do this without sort of a little glimpse of a horde. Um, that over there, um, oh, we've got to move that slide on, see? But this is, this is the veil of your horde. Don't need to zoom in on that. What we see, we see a pot there, we see um, ingots, we, we see um, chokers, we see uh, bracelets, we see pendants, we see coins, and lots of them are broken and we're thinking, interesting. They're, yes, use that word in the right context, the crap that they're taken away to be melted down are great jewels to us today. And it makes you think um, of their society. If they're taking this stuff to scrap, what must of the stuff be like that they were actually wearing? that was actually a lot more radiant and beautiful than this stuff. Um, I, I dismissed, um, I, I basically said that the silver coins themselves, if we could basically get into that one there, um, there, there there's the hole, hole there. Um, if we get to this coin here, um, I'm not really impressed with any coins from that period, roughly from about 400, even Roman coins, from about 400 to about um, maybe the Tudor period. Coins, mainly across most of Europe, are really poor quality in their designs. That's not what I would associate with the Viking world, but that's a Viking coin. But you go over here and you look at this axe here. Look at that beautiful um, inlaid axe. You can see that really clearly now. That is a hum. Uh, drum beautiful axe silver inlay iron brass axe head um, found in Jutland Denmark also dating to the 900s you look at something like this and you think that is really that is really interesting that you've actually got the sense of myths and legends in this axe um, and you've got the shaft going through there um, and this would have been bound on there, and you're looking at this and you think, I don't actually know what that is. If that's gold, then that's also something else. But, but you've got four metals there, but don't quote me on that. Yeah. But again, what is this about? Is, is it ceremonial? Is it to do with, is it a battle axe? Is it for cutting down trees? To be honest with you, the, the Vikings love their art, so any of those. Maybe um, a wealthy warrior just wanted a nice tarty axe to hang off the wall, yeah. And thing. that was the one I was going to go for, the tarty axe, the tarty <laughs> axe. Uh, this is, this is a, an iron staff. Um, is this a, some kind of a crozier? 
Um, is this is this for pointing? Very difficult to work that one out. Okay, down here. Um, what's that? Well, it depends how big it was. It's given us no idea of size. Is it size isn't everything. It's got long or no, four inches. It did. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a fair. It's a very long staff. Staff is going to be about that tall, isn't it? Um, uh, this the the the, the, the um, this is the Odin or the Volva figure. Um, from Denmark, also dating to about the 900s, a weird look, like sort of silver figure on a, on a throne, um, and you've you've got this that looks very um, much like it's from um, sort of um, Iron Age Iron Age Britain, and that itself is a gold a gold net ring. What? What an ant? There. That's not a snail, it's where it's sort of... It's Brian. Make it make it. Brian, yeah. Brian. You lot, I think Brian's you lot are really breaking down at this minute. Right, so it's... Well, what is it then? It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a chain. No, I know, it's broken, isn't it? It's broke. Oh, I told you, Gillian knows all about the sizes and everything. No, but you can see it there. There, there, there. It's a bit broken. Is it true that's six inches? <laughs> <laughs> it's a foot. <laughs> there you go. Um, a be beautiful um, brooch there. And this is the Hunterston brooch. This comes from Scotland. This dates from the early uh, Viking period. How beautiful is that? And rooms on it. So um, there's, no, there's no guesses what civilization has. It's not Pictish. It's, it, and look at, the, look at the beautiful silver work, beautiful silversmith with a mechanism there with runes on it as well. This is a really big, chunky thing. It's a smaller object, so it's quite chunky. Um, okay, Do if I. Get Anglo bigger than that. Let's not confuse it. <laughs> um, ado adopt, ad the adoption of another civilization, culturalization, that one. So you've got this over here. Um, this is another brooch. Let's just remind me what this one is. A copper alloy brooch, also from, um, say, about the 900s. Um, this is known, that one is known as the Valkyrie brooch. That was not that impressive. <coughs> but out of this whole collection, the thing that impresses me is, is this, um, where you've got care taken. If I can get this up. Now, that's, that's basically a wooden platter. And look at that. This is just something mundane that they would have eaten off with a bit of bread and, I don't know, um, they would have eaten off this. This is a proper platter. And again, they're carving into their wood with little crosses that sort of interweave, sort of um, birds, a uh, bit of cheese on there. Nothing wrong with a bit of cheese. Vindaloo. And vindaloo. Vindaloo. Um, and and uh, quickly, and this one, a typical Viking uh, sword. Um, and what we've got with this Viking sword is also composite. Um, one thing that we do know about Viking swords, if we look at, a, say, a samurai sword mm. from a completely different culture, um, is that the tang itself, uh, you've got the, um, the pommel, the hilt, the, the, the hilt and the guard, the tang. It, this would have been um, some of it inlaid, some of it decorated. Obviously, this is iron, <laughs> this is okay. But obviously, you've got silverware there. Uh, and this would have been um, extremely beautiful. And one thing that we see with the Staffordshire Hall is lots of these sort of pommel ends, um, but that's in an Anglo-Saxon context, but obviously through trade as well. And just finally, um, coming to the end of this, um, I wanted to mention the Scar Boat. Um, two women and a gentleman, various objects found uh, in the island of Sande, um, and this itself, the Scar Dragon plaque, so big. I used to think it was that size. It's yeah. tiny, it's titchy. It was found in a 6.5 metre long boat, uh, um, being a wooden plank built rather than clinker, oared rowing boat of a type known as a fairing. Um, but by the time of the excavation, one side of it had already washed away. Interestingly enough, uh, when it was found in the um, it was found in the 1990s, it was just by chance fine. The boat had been buried in a stone line pit. The excavations revealed had been dug um, too big because of this. The vessel had been packed securely into position with stones. Um, so obviously it may have been it, unlikely to have been um, within the water table, but maybe they may have thought there may, may have been erosion later on. Various treasures 
three individuals, gaming pieces, and the very famous um, whale uh, bone plaque. Um, and, you know, objects associated with um, warfare. There, there was a quiver dating maybe sometime around the 900s. And there it is, absolutely beautiful. And Kathy and I have seen actually the real thing itself. It's a really nice object. Um, I'm sure that was in a Kirkwall museum, wasn't it, rather than Sunday one? I'm not sure. But we, we did see it. We did see it. Beautiful, beautiful <coughs> object. And it's a typical sim symbol of, of, of Viking civilization within Orkney. They've, they've adopted this. So there's not the serpent, the serpent beasts coming in. What this plaque was used for? Don't really know. Um, it, it doesn't have any attachments or anything associated with it. The maybe it was an ornament on the wall. Maybe we have, we have maybe people chalked up information on it. This is what we're gonna have for dinner. I don't know. Interesting. Um, and there, there's another one a bit more clearly. Specials of the day. Uh, just, just a few things. A couple more Viking finds. Some of the leather work. Um, this, this, is, this is the type of leather work um, that they've also found at York. There you go. A bit more there. This, 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 is, um, um, this is a um, scabbard. scabbard. Um, we use those shapes today. Exactly, we do. Um, and there's, yes. Anyway, so are there any questions on that? Because that worked yep. really well. Go on. Why haven't everybody wanted to know why you haven't mentioned Noggin the Nog? <laughs> Do you know what, right? Um, me and Gillian don't want to hear any more of this nonsense because she's with me on this one, right? Gillian's the most yeah, important to the Viking Age. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, the I haven't the mentioned Nog in the Nog. <laughs> well, you should have done. Because I didn't think it was that relevant. Okay, I'll mention yeah. it in the lecture this afternoon. Yeah, you mentioned Nog, nog in the Nog. Right, any other questions? Yes, sorry. Go for it. Yeah. I'm, I'm only making this up. Was it because of seeing other head or you couldn't go on to the afterlife? No, it killed them quick. <laughs> so they wouldn't have killed them. Well, actually, them. Yeah, I, I, actually, actually, no, so I, actually. Have different then, for most of them. Right, Ellen, 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 right. I, I've done the typical thing of, as an archaeologist to presume that they had all been executed. If, if they, they could have all been beheaded after their death in the battle yes, where the yeah. Vikings won. Yeah. So, so, why did they behead them? Was it because they couldn't? No, we see we see this in Roman civilization as well. We we see the Romans did this. Yeah, but was it because they couldn't go to the afterlife as well? Because um, there was always an afterlife. There's loads of interpretations. There's loads of interpretations, and um, it's a very difficult one. But you you've actually brought up the dichotomy of presumption in archaeology. We presume everything, and they may have been buried by their own people after a battle where they won, and they beheaded them as a right to go into the afterlife. But we don't know. We weren't there, and I'm just making a presumption. No, no, you, you, you've actually asked, asked a question, which is a very good question. Right, any, any other questions? Right, Gillian, Gillian asked me, she wants the last word today. So go on, Gillian, give us the last word. Well, I was going to say, I quite like the Vikings now. I love them. Good, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. Um, that's the last word from Julian. Have you all enjoyed it today? Yeah. I will see you all next week. Thank you very much for your support. And, um, and, and obviously, Dennis and I will do the raffle, and we will make sure that um, uh, Dennis doesn't win it. I shouldn't be saying these stupid things. Okay, thank you very much. Is that mine? Thank you. Yes.